We're going to have a presentation over the lunch period today um, on the National Survey of Online Learning in Canada. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Tricia Donovan, is the lead from the Canadian Digital Research Association. Uh, Tricia is currently the principal of the Nova Scotia Community College Online Learning Group. And Tricia and I have known one another for a long time. Uh, when I was at BC campus, and Tricia was the executive director of eCampus Alberta. Uh, these co uh, conferences give us the opportunity to consider lots of interesting data that comes our way on the national scene. And we've also engaged the Canadian National Survey Group to provide an Ontario-specific report on online learning in Ontario, its growth, and the facets of that growth that should be important to us all. So without further introduction, Tricia Donovan. Thank you. It's a, a delight to be here and um, kind of David to not mention just how long we've known each other perhaps, but <laughs> we have been toiling in this space for some time. Um, as David said, my name is Tricia Donovan um, and I have had the benefit of working with um, consortia and eCampus Alberta for a number of years, and now I've just recently joined Nova Scotia Community College to build their eCampus. I'm going to take us through just a couple of quick slides of acknowledgements and then into really the Ontario specific slides against the national context. So you'll see me mix them up a little bit. Um, I do want to acknowledge that um, NSCC is very supportive of this work, and um, for the first time they have an eCampus. They started it in July of 2018. We're just getting started. We have nine fully online programs and um, lots of opportunity for growth. This survey is only made possible through our sponsors. Um, of no, a particular note, we wish to thank eCampus Ontario for your ongoing support, interest, work, and advocacy for gathering um, data and having evidence-based data on which we can base our decisions. And our background um, is certainly supported by the other eCampuses across the country, with some small support from um, um, uh, corporate sponsors as well. So I stand here to present today, but we, we do rep I do represent a survey team. Um, Nicole Johnson has just recently joined us. She's our primary author this year. And um, Dr. Tony Bates, those of you who were here the last two years, he presented as well. Jess Seaman from the Babson Survey Research Group and a host of wonderful consultants who really help us with our outreach, some of, some of whom may have been contacting you, asking you to complete the survey. So if you did, thank you very much. If you didn't, please do so next year. Um, it's important that we gather as many voices as we can. To be fair, Ontario has had a significant response, and for that we're very grateful. Um, as uh, the early morning presenter said, and then we went to a bar. Um, so this just gives you an example of, uh, sorry, a picture of, uh, from the Global Online Summit. Tony Bates, for those of you who know him, has been trying to retire for some 20 plus years. This was, this might have been his 20th plus effort at a retirement dinner where we created an advisory council so Tony can stay on with us. He doesn't want to do the work, but he doesn't want to leave and we're delighted for his expertise and passion. I'm going to run through a very quick background in the national survey and highlight some of the Ontario specific results. And then of course, as you saw this morning, please feel free to ask a question. If I can't answer it, I will. I've shared it with a couple people. We finished crafting the Ontario sub-report last night, about 11.30. Um, so some of the questions might need a little follow-up, but I'll do my best. Two things that I want to highlight that we talked about. There are nine key areas we asked questions of in the, in the survey, but we, we try to get at the institutional data. We're very careful about what data we ask of institutions because we understand it's difficult for you to provide responses, and I'll touch on that a little bit further. These are the key data points that we ask for. We ask a variety of questions as well around perceptions, policies, practice, getting at the underlying beliefs that people have um, around online learning, online and digital learning. And just from a methodology standpoint, I'll share with you that how we approach our work is we've developed a roster um, we can, of the leading people across the institutions, and then each time we reach out with a survey, or each time we reach out with a preliminary survey, we ask people, are these the right contacts for your institution? Typically, we start with the Vice President Academic, Institutional Researcher, Director of Teaching and Learning, and Registrar, and we, we go up to, um, up to 10 contacts per institution, but we reach out to four. That may need to be expanded. It is one of the challenges that we know is inherent in this work is that 
this kind of survey, the responses can't be answered by one source in the institution. So it's a collaborative effort. And as such, that also means there's probably some inherent, inherent complexities in who is responding to the survey They're from their perspective. Um, setting the context, we have identified across Canada 234 publicly funded institutions. That's our horizon, our universe of interest. Um, we, you can see we, we, we contact colleges, universities, CEGEPs, and private subsidized colleges in Quebec. And I've mentioned there's nine areas of focus. For the national response rate in 2019, we conducted the survey between May and um, April and July. Some slid into August, but um, overall we had a 70% response rate. We were pleased with that, um, 164, 234 institutions. And because the, the, our responses tend to come from the larger institutions, we actually look at the overall enrollments, for credit enrollments across Canada, as well as the online. And so you'll see that we're confident, just to give you context in the responses, that the responding institutions represent 90% of the student population base, the four credit population base, and 95% of all online enrollments. In Ontario, we had 100% response from the colleges. Thank you, all 25 of 25 responded. And for the universities, we had a 91% response rate with 21 of 23 universities responding. Ontario has been very strong in providing results, which gives us a chance to unpack the results in a way that we don't for the other jurisdictions. As David said, um, eCampus Ontario commissions an Ontario-specific report. So we break the data out into colleges and universities, and this is the only form in which we do that. Um, getting to the online enrollment data is tricky. I've mentioned it before. You'll hear us say it again and again, um, because in this year, we've, we've had to limit the comparisons that we could make in the online data. As someone said, as the uh, speaker earlier this morning said, there's a messy reality, and in our case, it's a messy reality of what institutions are tracking for online data. So we had hoped, with this being our third year of conducting the survey, that we could do a comparison from 2017, 2018, 2019, to be fair, the 2017 data was kind of um, challenging. Then we, we tried to map it to the 2018-19, and so we're actually about to craft a deeper dive on the online enrollment figures. So there'll be more coming out from us in a, in a paper. We've really limited how much we can speak about the data for the sake of this, um, this current um, production, simply because we're still crafting and writing and needing to dig into it a bit deeper. The online course enrollments across the country grew about 10% while the on-campus enrollments have remained essentially unchanged. That we see, if anyone had been following the Babson survey report in recent, in earlier years, they would have seen the same kind of um, pattern happening. Our key findings nationally are that the online learning continues to steadily increase. We did some work in 2018 to try to refine the definitions because what one institution calls online versus what another calls distance, um, digital, blended, hybrid, it's a it's a bit all over the board, but to be fair, if you were here last year, you may remember that we were very pleased to find that we had more than a majority of agreement on the definitions that we provided. So we didn't ask about definitions this year, but our results in the open-ended comments continue to tell us that it's an evolving piece of work, that we need to continuously stay on top of it to reflect changing practice. The, many of the open-ended comments that were provided to us this year talked about how um, there were challenges in tracking the internal data, that they were hoping to track better next year, et cetera. And so essentially what we're finding is that many institutions are telling us they recognize the importance of it, they thank us for asking the questions, but they say their internal systems do not yet track this, this, behavior, this um, activity, whether it be online, digital blended, or whether it be students by location, et cetera. It's a real challenge which we hope to continue to improve upon. Um, alternative credentials remain exploratory. OER remains emergent. And the perception, there's, a, there's a paradox happening where the challenge in that the perception of online learning is important at institutions, but the implementation of strategic plans lags behind that. When we get to Ontario, all of the, institu all of the Ontario institutions offer some form of online. Um, Ontario exceeds the growth across the country. So you, um, we had mentioned that, uh, I, sorry, I mentioned that nationally we had an increase of 10% in enrollments. In Ontario, there's an increase of 14%. And when we ask uh, institutions to forecast what they think their enrollments will be for the coming year, we see that there's a significant amount of interest or forecast or expectation 
that the online enrollments will continue to increase, particularly in Ontario's colleges, um, but and a little less so in the universities, but nationally there's an expectation by 71% of the institutions that online enrollments will increase in the coming year. We ask institutions how important online learning is for their strategic plan or their academic plan. Again, colleges in Ontario, very strong, identifying online. 96% of Ontario colleges identifying online as strategic important, um, or very to extremely important, and then nationally we see that 71%. So again, the Ontario colleges seem to be very engaged in online learning. I don't think that's a surprise to any of you who are in the room. Um, due to the history of Ontario Learn, the work of eCampus Ontario, Contact North, etc. There's been a strong focus in this province on online learning, and I think it shows, um, and I think it's important that we pay attention to uh, the support that those organizations provide to your institutions to help grow online learning and build successful practices. We did try this year to ask about where, where students are coming from, where your online students are coming from. Only the universities were asked this question because colleges said that they were challenged to provide that data. And you can see that the majority of students, online students, are living within their province. Ontario reports a slightly higher number of students coming from outside the province. Not entirely surprised given the number of institutions and the, um, the high reputation that Ontario institutions have. I'm having to talk fast because we have 20 minutes. So just so you know. <laughs> Um, when we look at the importance of online enrollments, once again, each year we ask this and institutions will tell us that the primary reason or the biggest um, reason that they see online education as important is to increase student access. That's the same for Ontario, as you can see that. Um, and again, you can see the breakdown for colleges, universities, and national. And I need to compliment Elan Paulson and um, Lucia. I'm saying that right, thank you, <laughs> who created these uh, graphics for us for an Ontario infographic. There's one that will be available online today, and then we have yet to build the national one, but full kudos to, um, to their wonderful work to make this look good. Um, also, we can see that, um, once again, very, there's, of all the reasons that institutions are involved in growing online, it's not about reducing costs. So those who have been around in this space 10 or 20 years ago, that was the myth. That hasn't panned out, nor should it, um, because there's more sophisticated um, requirements and the complexity of offering online. When we look at Ontario, roughly one half of the Ontario institutions report that they either have or were exploring a formal policy on OER or open pedagogy. There's a slide there, of course, to talk about the, op the use of open textbooks. Uh, wonderful to see Ontario um, shining in that space due to the investment and the attention that's been given by, I'm sure, people in this room around growing um, open education re resource practice, open pedagogy, and use of open textbooks. Um, there's a higher than average use of most of the technologies for teaching and learning. And you'll see that, I'm just going to flip through, you'll see this in the, there's a significant use of video. And we've been seeing this in the last couple of years. And what we're interested in from a, from an academic perspective is, are these live online cap live lectures or online captures, are they being grounded around the context and design of a course? Or, or there are some instances where there's simply um, faculty video lectures being produced, put online, and not perhaps within context to help students learn. So it's something we want to pay attention to. Um, when um, we talk about um, who's answering these surveys, you can see at the bottom, we've very, once again, very limited activity being reported around um, augmented reality, virtual reality, gaming, et cetera. And I think, and we've said this, I think, on this very stage last year, we think that that may well be due to the, to the people who are responding to the survey may not know what some faculty are doing in the more innovative, leading edge spaces. And so there may be a disconnect between those who are responding to the survey and what's really happening on the ground. Um, training faculty for digital fluency was identified as important for online education in Ontario. The top identified barrier, once again, for across the country was inadequate training for faculty. And then we can see that in particular, um, in particular, we find that there is a, there's a we asked some, some questions this year around, how, what do you do around professional development for your online faculty? Do you, is it mandatory that they have professional development prior to their first time teaching online? Or is it um, voluntary? And then what do you do with your experienced faculty? And, um, oh, sorry, I'll come, I'll come back to that one in a second. Um, this will show you the perceived barriers where you can see the additional faculty time required, inadequate training and support, and acceptance of online by faculty. 
When we look at professional development, you can see that the vast majority across the country, so this is a national slide, um, just because of timing, we're back and forth, but so the national slide, um, the majority of professional development offered for online faculty is voluntary. Very, in very few cases is it required, um, and the same for when we're looking at experienced faculty. So that, I think that is reason or cause for concern when we think about what we're exposing students to. So I'll take off my, my CDLRA hat and just say from a, a long-time distance educator, I have great concern um, when I see faculty who are being loaded into online courses without having the digital fluency skills, without any support. Um, we, I hear phrases of faculty who feel prisoners to online, or maybe institutions post, fa um, post faculty to online courses because they don't want them in the classroom. This is not a practice that we can have or should have at all. So I think we need some real advocacy around what's happening around PD, and we need to expand what's happening around PD so that we're not getting the same coalition of the willing, but actually working with new faculty, experienced faculty, reinvigorating teaching practices to support students and faculty success. So I'll put my CDLRA hat back on. I have to do that. These opinions are mine and not that of the association. <laughs> um, blended and hybrid learning continues to grow. Um, we see it's widespread and expected to increase. A high rate here in Ontario's universities where 94% of the institutions indicated that they believe blended and hybrid is, is, is going to increase. Um, and again, colleges are also higher than our national figures showing 76%. Open education resources, I mentioned earlier, nationally, it's exploratory, experimental, and growing. Um, looks like I've doubled the open textbook slide. I guess I really liked this image. Sorry about that. I was at a, the Global Summit um, a couple weeks ago, and Stephen Downs was presenting, and there were a couple of places where he just had a blank slide and said, oh, I was going to fill that in. So at least I had an image there. No offense to Stephen. <laughs> um, key findings for Ontario, there's a higher than average offering of badges, micro-credentials, and stackable credits. And you can see that that's happening across the board in terms of um, uh, across the national context. One of the things that's kind of ironic or perhaps most interesting in our responses to this question this year was that the highest response rate we had for alternative credentials was 40% of the responding institutions said other. So that says to us that people may not know, or 42%, I should say, may not entirely know what we meant by these um, phrases. And so we, we talked about in 2018, we've done definitions around distance online, blended and hybrid. We determined this year that distance is ubiquitous. The majority of distance education is happening online, so we've dropped distance. But as we go back into definitions, I think it's really important that we begin to get some system understanding around what we mean when we're talking about micro-credentials, stackable credits, blockchain, etc. There's a lot of hype, a lot of work in the literature, but do the institutions do all the institutions know what's happening, or are we all talking about different things again? So it's a challenge when we're trying to get at tracking national trends or jurisdictional patterns if we aren't talking about the same thing. I think one of the things that was really compelling to us when we looked at the open-ended comments, um, and there's, a, there's a, a tremendous richness in the open-ended comments that we have yet to really mine. Uh, we have George Felicianos from Royal Roads University, who's now taking a, um, a qualitative analysis, a deep qualitative analysis approach into our 2018, sorry, 2017, 2018, and 2019 open-ended comments. But I was struck by this one in particular around the comments coming from Ontario institutions who reveal a strong desire to innovate um, online offerings, looking at improving access, quality, delivering experiential learning and op creating opportunities for workforce skill development, which we continue to know is an increasing pressure for institutions as we respond to the future of work needs, et cetera. We made a couple of recommendations this year around, um, perhaps for our work, but also in working with institutions, around what we need to do around improving tr internal tracking systems. We've had the benefit of a number of VPAs um, or other others that institutions tell us simply by asking the question has made them think about tracking it, or perhaps they had always wanted to track it but haven't yet done so. So we have to be fairly judicious in the questions we're asking in the survey, but we, we highly recognize that we've got to work on um, helping institutions know how to track their activity in online and digital learning. That's what you'll see coming out in our um, deep dive on the online enrollment report, because it's yet to be tracked consistently. You would think you'd ask, what is, you know, can you identify an online student? And then some, some institutions will say, 
Well, is that four credit? Is that um, a part time? Is it full time? Is it there's a whole continuing ed? There's a whole bunch of things that fall into that. So we don't think that what people are reporting up is entirely consistent yet. And um, I'm getting the five minutes, which is good. <laughs> um, we also, we will be working on that, and we, we are seeking your help on that as advocates, I think, for this work, that to get to good data, we need to work with our in, in institutions to improve the internal tracking mechanisms. Um, the ongoing, evolving inquiry of definitions, I've mentioned that, is critically important. I know it's not entirely sexy. People have argued, wrestled, debated definitions in distance and online for at least 100 years, probably will for another 100, but we're gonna try to do what we can to have our little impact to make sure that we can have um, comparable data on trends. We also thought that perhaps one of the things that we can do that would help institutions, because at the very core, what I, need, what I should have said from the beginning is, the entire purpose of this survey is for us to add value to the institutions. We, are, we, we fundamentally jumped into this game so that we could figure out what's happening and provide value back to the institutions. So in our surveys, we ask, what else would you like to see? How can we add value? What would you like to see in the future, et cetera? Um, and we, we, are be, we are thinking, we're quite strong. I think we're, all, we're about 99.9% .9 on this decision that it will be easier for institutions if we only ask to track the enrollment data every two or three years. And that would give us, uh, one, it would reduce your, respond, your respondent burden as a survey respondent, but it also means that when someone's providing that data in a two or three year window, that it's likely to have internal consistency and we can better trust it. And so some, some uh, lots of programs track this data at the program or department level, but not at the institution level. So this is our way of trying to then stand back, work with the institutions and work towards better data. Our conclusions, it is a messy reality. You've mentioned, you've heard me mention that three or four times. It's sort of one of the, um, we usually come out guns blazing with how excited we are with the results. And this year it was like, ah, we had really hoped we could have some consistency and do some tracking. So I can only apologize that it's, it's work we still have to unpack and do. Um, I think it's really critical that we as institutions recognize that you cannot manage what you, what you don't measure. We know that, but how do we work with our institutions to improve that? But I would like to say that I think what's more important is that you can expedite solutions if you share and collaborate. What we find in many of the comments, the open-ended comments, is that people's interest or what they're sharing with us about what's happening in online and digital is highly aspirational. It's full of heart and desire to increase access, to improve student supports, all of those wonderful things. And yet there's a whole sub-layer of institutions asking us, can you tell us how you staff this? Can you find out how people are managing their LMS or how do they do their PD? How many courses do they put up online each year? How many programs can you put up online? Really operational stuff that for some reason our institutions hold close like it's a treasure chest instead of opening it up and sharing. Um, I don't think there's that many secrets in doing really good practice, really good design and supporting student success. I come from a collaborative space, I recognize that. But I think it's really important that we begin to think that we, we, we can't wait to everyone try to excel and, and develop a niche and be the number one in the market. I think we all need to be in the top 10 in the market in terms of really trying hard to support student success. And the best way to do that, I think, is through system level sharing, collaboration, um, and really sort of just expediting solutions. It is urgent. And I know it's been urgent forever, but I still think it's increasingly urgent, especially as we look at what ha what's happening coming down the pipe and the pressure of institutions to increase digital le learning skills, digital fluency. We can't all wait to see if we've got the shiniest, best model, but we can partner with each other and build a better model together. And as always, insight, feedback, and research support are welcome. All of our data is open and available. We invite graduate students to um, partake in taking a look, a deeper dive, or a slice on any of this data. Um, our website is slightly out of date. We'll be better by this evening when I get the, um, the reports up. So today we are going to release the national report in English and French. We'll also release the Ontario report in English. As I mentioned, it was finished last night at 11.30, so we have to do the translation yet. <laughs> this is a fast and wild game to be part of, I can say. Um, but it's a true privilege to be able to do this work. This is something David and I had interest in and tried to do with WCET years ago, and it's really, it's, it's quite fabulous to be able to report on what's happening in online and digital education in Canada, rather than rely on data from other jurisdictions. So with that, I 
am opening the floor for questions, I think, David. I think very ready. I think aching to be ready. I think that what we've seen is a really strong appetite to grow um, and to be engaged. And I think that the, you know, the fact that your, your online registrations and enrollments are increasing higher than anywhere else in the country is but a sign that you have an appetite for and a desire to do this and to do this well. And number two is when you asked, when you asked about badges, do you include ones that are just at the course level, or are you asking about institutionally approved badges that may be worth defining? Is that Don Prisant? Is he here? Is that his question? <laughs> we simply asked if um, we simply asked institutions to report if they were using badges. So we didn't get at that granular or program level. It's a great question, and perhaps something we can improve upon for next year. Please join me in welcoming. Well, uh, thank you, Patricia. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.